Hey everyone, welcome back to Brian's Mysteries and Adventures on Trail. I hope everyone is having a great weekend so far, or if you're watching this video on another day, I hope you're enjoying your day. In today's video, we will be going back to Mount Rainier, which is in the state of Washington. I will have some maps up here in a few seconds. Mount Rainier is 14,411 feet. For those of you that go in meters, it is 4,392 meters high above sea level. It's located sort of in the western central part of the state of Washington, as you can see in that map. Mount Rainier is a stratovolcano located in the Cascade Mountains. Because of the very high probability of an eruption sometime in the near future, it is generally considered the most dangerous volcano in the world. Now, I'm not trying to fear monger. I have no idea what the chances are of it going off anytime soon. If you're interested in that, I'll have some more links to info in the description or you can do your own research. Today's case is, in my opinion, the most baffling case that I've ever read or researched about Mount Rainier or in and around this area. We're going to be going back to July of 2010. We're going to be talking about the disappearance of Eric Lewis. Eric was only 57 years old at the time. He was a resident of Duval, Washington, which is roughly a two and a half hour drive to Mount Rainier. He was very familiar with this mountain. It was actually his love. His family said that it was his passion to climb Mount Rainier. He had already summited it over 10 times in the past. On Thursday, July 1st of 2010, he went climbing with two of his friends, Trevor Lane and Don Storm Jr. They were also experienced uh, climbers and hikers. However, they were quite a bit younger than Eric. On this day, the men were climbing the Gibraltar Ledges, which is known as the first official route to the summit of Mount Rainier. Two men back in 1870, Stevens and Van Trump had forged this path and it's now the most popular way to get up to the top. It's important to note that much of Mount Rainier is full of glaciers and crevasses. As you all know, or those of you that don't know, a glacier is a slow giant mass of moving ice. They can break apart at any time. Not only that, a crevasse is a hole in this ice and it's often masked by snowfall. So if you happen to step on that and it's not sturdy, you can fall anywhere from a foot down to however many feet down that crevasse goes. And this is very, very dangerous. That's very big hazard to, to climbers. On this particular day, Don Storm Jr., he was in the lead with Trevor Lane a little bit further behind him and then Eric was in the rear. Now, the whole, all the men were tethered together with a rope. The two guys in front decided that they were going to stop for a rest. This was at around 13,900 feet. As they waited for Eric to come up, he never did, so they gave a, a tug on the rope while well, they kept pulling it, and he was no longer attached to the rope. He had unclipped himself from their tether. According to later statements the men gave, they had seen him just prior to taking their break. So they were very confused. They didn't know why he would have unclipped himself, maybe to go off and use the bathroom, possibly something happened. So they proceeded to thoroughly examine the whole area. They searched high and low, anything they could have thought of. And then they climbed up to the summit because they thought maybe he somehow got around them. However, once they got to the summit, he wasn't there either. So they started making their way back down to Camp Muir, where this climb began. The Gibraltar Ledges route starts from Camp Muir and ascends the upper Cowlitz Glacier towards the Cowlitz Cleaver. The crux, if you will, of the route is the ledge system, which is why it got the name Gibraltar Ledges. Immediately after getting back to Camp Muir, the two men contacted search and rescue. The search immediately got started, searching the various areas, including the Gibraltar Glacier, the various Gibraltar chute areas, in and around where the men had been hiking, climbing. They contacted the army. They brought in a Chinook helicopter. It's important to understand that the reason they have to use helicopters like this is because a standard helicopter can only fly to a certain altitude before it starts having difficulty or it could possibly crash. These Chinook helicopters can climb 
as high as up to, I think one report said even close to 18,000 feet in altitude. Now this is uh, some pictures that have been going past here are pictures of the actual search. You can see these searchers are tethered together with a rope there as well. It's just a very important safety precaution that you need to do in these type of climbing environments. Now at some point during the search, they did locate Mr. Eric Lewis's backpack and his shovel. These items were located at roughly 13,600 feet. The search and rescue teams then found a small snow cave at roughly 13,800 feet. Unfortunately, Mr. Lewis did not have a sleeping bag with him, any type of quilt, any type of shelter. He barely had any food, maybe a bar or two. He didn't even have a puffy jacket. This was not a good scenario. The authorities were very concerned once this search got started, they knew that the odds of him surviving a couple of nights were slim to none. What no one could figure out though, even at this point, was why had Eric unclipped himself from the tether? It is important to note that the men were facing very high winds, roughly 40 miles per hour. The visibility had gotten very bad. Apparently it was only about five feet. There were concerns, but at that point the men were all doing well. Why wouldn't Eric have just told the other men what he was doing? Because the tether is a safety precaution. The reason that climbers do this is because if one of the team members falls, the other team members try and self-arrest and dig in as much as they can to stop the fall. Eric, having years of experience under his belt, would have known this. It's likely that he only would have untethered himself for some kind of emergency or if he saw something, possibly was experiencing signs of frostbite. It's impossible to say. These are all just theories and guesses. If you guys have any suggestions, of course, I'd love to hear from you in the comments. But unfortunately, after so many days of searching, and aside finding the backpack and shovel on the second day and that small snow cave, they didn't find anything else. Now, I will say that the weird thing was that they found these things only about 200 feet from where the men, the two men, were taking their break that day. The commander, Glenn Kessler, who was in charge of this search and rescue operation, he is quoted in saying that the elevation and glacial terrain of this area demands such a high technical level that the odds of one man finding his way out while all these other people that are very highly trained have been looking for him in and around of that area was basically a statistical impossibility. He said that they've thoroughly searched all the areas in and around where they were likely to have found Eric Lewis, where he was been throughout the day, the fact that the weather had gotten worse, the winds were so high, he said that we just have to start scaling back this search. And that's exactly what they did. They did keep various patrols on the mountain for another couple of weeks. However, in searches like this, when they don't have any clues and the clues that they did have, they searched in and out very thoroughly. It's mind boggling. I mean, what could have possibly happened to this man who was at one minute tethered to his friends, climbing up Mount Rainier, and the next minute seemingly had vanished into thin air. It's also very important to note that when they first started looking for Eric, they went back and they found no footprints. The only footprints they found were the footprints leading up to the point where he apparently unhooked himself from the tether. There was no footprints leading off in any other direction. There was no footprints in and around the little snow cave they found. There was no footprints around his backpack. It was like he unhooked himself from that tether and somehow just vanished into thin air. There was no crevasses in and around the area where his footprints did stop. If you're thinking maybe he fell into a crevasse right there, they looked for that, nothing to speak of. In my opinion, and I know the opinion of a lot of other people that have covered this case or researched it, it is by far one of the most bizarre and unsettling disappearances in the history of Mount Rainier. I would definitely like to hear what you guys think about this. What do you think happened to Mr. Eric Lewis? How did he just vanish into thin air only a few feet away from his climbing partners? 
There's so many different theories. I'd love to hear your thoughts. For me, I don't have any idea. The only thing I can think of is that he got injured somehow or something was wrong. Maybe he started getting sick and he needed to untether himself for some kind of emergency. But then why was there no other footprints in and around the area where that happened? There's theories, everything from the other climbers being involved to him taking his own life. I don't really think that's holds any water but i'd love to hear what you guys think it's been over a decade now and eric lewis's remains still have not been found is it possible that he made it off the mountain alive maybe is suffering from amnesia it's possible i would like to dedicate this video to eric lewis his family his friends everyone who worked so hard to try and bring him home if he is still out there, I pray that you do find your way home to get back with your family. If Mr. Lewis did pass on Mount Rainier that day, it does bring me a little comfort to know that at least he died in his most favorite place in the entire world. Thank you all for watching. Thank you all for your support and all your comments. Special thank you to co.ag for providing the background music. Hopefully I'll see you all in the next one. Take care. Hey everyone, thanks for sticking with me till the end. I always hate to ask for any type of help, despite the fact that I love helping other people, but I just wanted to reach out and ask you guys to try and share my videos. I know that many of you do all the time, but if there's anybody you might think might enjoy them or just help us, you know, try and gain farther reach on YouTube, you know how all those algorithms work. You guys probably know how it works better than I do, but anyway, so today's backpacking tip I just wanted to talk about when you are purchasing your gear. I have seen in my time so many people that before a through hike especially, they'll purchase like three or four different backpacks in thinking that they might need a backup pack or a backup gear. I remember I saw this one guy that had literally bought six different Tokes pots. In my opinion, you're better off buying some gear that you feel comfortable with. Then while you're out on trail, if something goes wrong or if you feel it's not working for you, you might see somebody else that has something that's working great. It's better just to switch things out there. Now, unless you're going with something custom because those things do take a little bit longer to make. But I just think that sometimes it's better to save more money for when you are out on trail or you are out camping. You might want to explore the different towns that you come into if you spend so much crazy money before you even leave. My other tip for today, and I know a lot of people might not agree with this, especially on a through hike because people are always trying to save weight. But aside carrying a headlight, I like to carry a little flashlight. You can find ones that are an ounce or two or a little camp light where you can hook or hang in your tent. I'll show you a picture of the one that I have. Again, mine weighs, I think, just under two ounces. It's got a lot of lumens. It's rechargeable. The model I have is called the Nightcore LR10. It's great because it's got a little hook that flips back and forth so you can hook it to your tent but the bottom is also magnetic so you can stick it to anything that's magnetic and like i said it's usb rechargeable all right everyone in my next video i'll be discussing food storage different types of bear proof containers bags all that kind of stuff so i will see you in the next one take care